in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the master storyteller. And this parable, in my opinion, is Jesus' masterpiece. This isn't just based on the content of the parable, but also why Jesus tells this parable in the first place. Now, you can flatten this parable into a moralistic tale about loving those around you. Sadly, this is what most people do with it, even some Christians. Jesus' magnum opus of a parable. They do this by ripping it out of its context. And so, because so many people mishandle Jesus' best parable, we're actually going to make our way through the entire parable today. So, first, why did Jesus tell this parable? Well, it's pretty familiar, but we don't want to gloss over it. We don't want to skip ahead to the parable. Otherwise, we will misunderstand the parable like so many do. Now, a lawyer shows up. And he wants to ask Jesus a question. Now, lawyer here means an expert in the law, or rather the Torah of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Now, he also would have been an expert in all the Old Testament as well. And this lawyer comes to Jesus with evil motives. The lawyer is not asking innocent questions. He shows up to put Jesus to the test. And what he asks Jesus is actually a question about salvation. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it's that salvation question that sets the stage for everything else in the Gospel reading. Now, in typical Jesus fashion... Jesus answers with a question of his own. What's written in the Torah? How do you read it? And the lawyer does give a correct answer. Love God perfectly. Love your neighbor perfectly. And to the lawyer's answer, an answer that comes from his mindset that's focused on behavior. Well, Jesus piles more law on top of law. You're right, he says. Do that, and you'll live. The lawyer wasn't satisfied, though, because he wanted to justify himself. That means he wants to be right with God based on his own behavior his good works. His questions aren't neutral or innocent. His first question wasn't. It's about salvation itself. And his next question isn't a neutral one either. Who's my neighbor? Now, many Jews would have wanted to know the answer to that question. In Jesus' day, in their minds... Fellow Jews were certainly neighbor, as well as Gentile converts uh, to, uh, who believe in the God of the Scriptures. But Greeks weren't, Romans weren't, and Samaritans? Certainly not. And so Jesus sets out to answer the lawyer's salvation questions, the human mindset about behavior, and the common thinking about our neighbors. And to do all that, he builds his parable based on our Old Testament reading, especially its last verse. And it's a, it's a story that the lawyer and all of Jesus' hearers would have known very well. Jesus' parable starts with a very common picture for them. If they had news outlets back then, there would have been headline after headline like this. Man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho fell among robbers. Traveling in Jesus' day was dangerous, especially when you were alone. 
And we all know what happens next. A priest and a Levite come by. But when they see him, they pass by on the other side. Now, the priest isn't a bad guy. He's traveling alone. Very dangerous. He's traveling home from Jerusalem to Jericho, a city where a lot of priests lived. He was going home, most likely after his two-week stint of serving in the temple. Individual priests were not at the temple 24-7. They served on a rotation. So traveling home, he sees a guy naked, unconscious, maybe even dead at the side of the road. So what goes through his mind? Well, besides the fact that the robbers might still be around, he doesn't know who this guy is. He can't tell if he's an Israelite or not. His clothes and his speech would have helped the priest figure that out. Besides that, if the priest got too close and the guy is dead or he dies while the priest is offering him help, well, the priest would have been ritually unclean. He would not have been able to go home. He would have had to turn right back around and go back to Jerusalem. And he would have had to stay there for a complicated seven-day process to become ritually clean again so that he could be a priest in a God-pleasing way so that he could continue to receive offerings and food for himself and for his family in a God-pleasing way. So he looks at this situation and he doesn't want the hassle. Who would? And besides, he in that situation does what the Lord had commanded the priests to do in Leviticus. You are to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. Dead guy is unclean. So he passed by on the other side. Now the Levite comes along. He does exactly what the priest does. And this would not have been surprising to Jesus' hearers, actually. They knew, because of the layout of the road, that the Levite maybe saw what the priest did. He could tell he was a priest based on what he was wearing. And the priest, the priest was his spiritual superior, his boss. Who was he to disagree with the priest? So he passed by on the other side. Now, what happens next is very surprising. Would have been shocking to Jesus' hearers. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to, he went to him. Jesus' hearers would have expected him to say, an Israelite. That was the typical threefold division of the people of Israel. Priest, Levite, Israelite. Instead, Jesus put someone into the story that the Jews hated, and he makes him the hero of the story. The Samaritans were hated for all sorts of reasons, but Jesus does this to drive his point home. And it's because of what this Samaritan does. The Samaritan does godlike things. He's really the Christ figure of the story. The Samaritan has compassion. And this is not human compassion or mercy, because in the Gospels, compassion is only ever applied to Jesus or to the God or Jesus figure in a parable. Besides all that, Jesus applies Language to the Samaritan from Hosea 6 and Ezekiel 16. Words that only applied to Yahweh. In those Old Testament texts, Yahweh comes to the one who's left for dead. He binds up. He heals. He revives after two days and raises up on the third. 
Hosea 6 also talks about priests and robbers and even hints at Samaritans too. And the lawyer would not have missed any of this. After his story, Jesus finally asks a question. And his question shows that it's not about who your neighbor is, but rather a neighbor is someone who shows mercy. And the lawyer again gave a correct answer. Couldn't bring himself to say Samaritan, though. And Jesus' final word serves as a final crushing weight of law for a lawyer who wants to save himself by his behavior. Go and do likewise. So to summarize, Jesus tells a parable built up from 2 Chronicles 28, and over top that, he layers words and languages and themes from two places, Ezekiel 16 and Hosea 6. And he does this to emphasize that the Samaritan in the parable is, well, him. Because the simplest answer to the lawyer's initial question, what must I do to be saved, is actually Hosea 6, verse 6. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The Lord's steadfast love for you, not sacrifice from you. Knowledge of God, faith in Him, rather than what you do for Him. And the Lord bookended this gospel parable with crushing law. Why? To show the lawyer that he was not on the right path. Not even close. That he wasn't in need of just a little pick-me-up, a little direction, a little pep talk. No. He's the man in the ditch and he doesn't even know it. But Jesus is there to save him. And so for the lawyer, Jesus' parable, along with his, his questions and answers, they are a call to repentance and faith. What about for you? Well, if you want it to be a law parable, well, okay. Then Jesus' questions are for you. Be a neighbor. Perfectly. No excuses. Because a neighbor isn't someone in your daily life. But it's you who is merciful to the people in your daily life. Family. Family. Friends, enemies, doesn't matter. A neighbor is someone who always puts the other person first. No grudges, free forgiveness, free mercy. Time, money, blood, sweat, tears, all for the other person. That's what it means to be a neighbor. And the gospel truth is, that Christ is true neighbor. He came to raise you up from the ditch of sin and death. He went into the ditch after us, bearing our sin, going into death at Calvary. We aren't called to be the Samaritan. Jesus is calling us to confess that we are lost without him, dead without him that we don't have any good to offer him or others apart from him saving us, apart from our faith in him. And when we are saved, well, the good fruit abounds. We're set in new relationships, innkeeper to the man, man to the innkeeper, innkeeper and man to the Samaritan. Each of us to each other each of us individually and all of us together with Jesus, joined together and together with him in his body and blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. 
It's masterful. A parable to show what Hosea 6, verse 6 is all about. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The Lord's steadfast love for you, not sacrifice from you. Knowledge of God, faith in Him rather than what you do for Him. It's what the lawyer needed to believe in order to be saved. You too. In the name of Jesus.